Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Outer Wilds. I didn't know what to expect when I bought this. I saw it on the Steam sale, watched the trailer and thought, this is about space alright. Then I did a little research and found out that the game won multiple awards even before the full version came out in 2019. But unfortunately it was completely overshadowed by and confused with a little project called The Outer Worlds, which came out half a year later. But the games themselves could not be more different from each other. The Outer Worlds is basically another Fallout and Outer Wilds without the V is an exploration game. The only thing those games have in common is... And I'm so sorry to say it, but my Fallout needs are satisfied. Outer Wilds, on the other hand, managed to blow my mind all the way through. The first five minutes alone were able to put me into a state of profoundness. I started up a new game and there was no pompous cutscene, no explanation. Just you, the night sky, a campfire and some marshmallows. You play as the newest recruit of the Outer Wilds Venture Program on the planet Timberhearth. Translation, you are a blue, four-eyed alien astronaut on the verge of your first solo mission. Some others of your race are already out there, exploring some planets. And now, it's your turn. Before you can launch into the great nothing though, you need to get the launch codes for your ship. And my ship, in all honesty, looks like a high school science fair project. At first glance at least. What gives me comfort is that my ship has gold-laced windows. Just like with real spacesuits and equipment, gold will prevent your eyes from becoming blind when you are in space. Just another tidbit on the side. You can find your launch codes at the observatory, which is up the hill. The way to the observatory is your tutorial, which is incredibly effective in teaching you all the relevant mechanics and a bit about space in general. A friend of yours needs to test out his new and improved model ship. Here you can learn the controls of your ship without the fear of imminent demise and fail terribly at it while still having a lot of fun. The next station features some kids who want to play hide and seek with you, so you bust out your signal scope to locate them by sound. In fact, my signal scope is so strong, if I want to find my other colleagues out in the solar system, I just need to point my scope to a planet and I might be able to hear them play some music up there. You will also learn how to use a shootable camera probe, how to behave in a zero-g environment and what things to avoid. The best thing is you don't need to do any of this, but if it's your first time playing then you will be glad you did. You can even stay a while longer and get educated about topics like gravitational forces and quantum mechanics. Trust me, you'll need it. Alright, I made my way to the operator and of course I'm expecting a mission, so... Which planet of alien creatures will I blast to bits? Is it Earth? Please let it be Earth. Those bastards had it coming for a long time. But no, he's just asking me, what do you want to do once you're out there? I'm sorry, what? Oh my god, this is awesome! I can do whatever the hell I want and go wherever I please. No quest markers, no missions, just absolute freedom. The last time I felt this unrestricted was in Morrowind. That was in 2002. This total freedom also includes just not going anywhere, but why would I do that when I have a solar system to explore that is packed to the brim with things to find? And so beautiful to boot. Sure, these are not cutting edge graphics, but you can't deny the whimsy that is portrayed on your home planet and the vast beauty of the galaxy that surrounds you. Standing on the surface of any planet and witnessing the sun illuminate the sphere while a meteor flies by is just so damn pretty. And we haven't even begun to explore yet. So after a short visit to the moon and finding an old astronaut colic there, I was ready to go further out and explore the real planets. The closest ones were the Hourglass Twins, two planets that rotate around each other. One of them is filled with caves you can explore, while the other one is just composed of sand. And it gradually seeps into the holes of the first planet like it's ebb and tide. So that's cool, we have some cool physics-based mechanics, but what is this structure in the distance? It looks like a spaceship and at first I thought it was one of ours. But it turns out it belongs to another alien race that is long gone. I didn't know what to make of these scribblings on the walls, but by translating them I found out that this was a form of communication for the crew. This right here was an escape pod, 
and these Nomai, as they call themselves, built a city somewhere in these caverns. And of course I want to see it for myself, but right now I can't. The sand is already closing down all the caverns, but that's no problem. I'm just going to wait until the sand shifts back. At least, that's what I thought. Oh no. I woke up at my campfire again, wondering why I am still alive and at the beginning of the game. No one remembers the sun going supernova, but for some reason my character still remembers everything that happened, including the launch codes. At this point I had several theories in my mind, one of them time travel, and I was correct, it's part of the game. Every 22 minutes, and I'm talking about real time here, the sun is going to explode and there is nothing I can do about it. But why is this happening? There must be a reason for this, right? I went back to the Hourglass Twins and because the universe was reset, I was able to make it into the underground city before the sand seals the entrance. And as every great ruin, it greeted me with a dark, warm and silent embrace. I made my way to what appeared to be a control unit and the balls of light reacted to my presence. I moved them around one by one and in turn, the city lit up for me, giving way to a not very knee friendly layout. I looked down and I realized that the sand was filling the city too, and since the districts are hanging at different heights, I only had a limited time to explore the lower levels as well. So far I was content with jumping around houses, examining dead bodies of the Nomai and taking the scenery in. There were some scriptures on the walls here and there, but it was in the temple district where I found more backstory. It turns out the Nomai came here because they searched something. Their scriptures talk about a signal called the Eye of the Universe, and it is somewhere around this solar system. Apparently the Eye is even older than the universe itself, so maybe it holds the key to break me out of this time loop and stop the sun from blowing up? I mean, I'm basically immortal now, so of course I'm going to visit every planet, read up on their research and find out what the Eye really is. Prepare to read a lot of text in a lot of different forms and be confronted with tech that comes straight out of a good science fiction book. If you can find the tech, that is. Because every planet houses different mechanics and is also unique in the ways it tries to prevent you from uncovering their secrets. Your home planet, for example, features an underground water current you can ride to reach several hidden locations. The planet called Dark Bramble doesn't even look like a planet and more like a plant that is held together by insanely thick vines. And I wouldn't recommend going into the core. It's like one of those Harry Potter tents. Small on the outside, big, confusing and hard to navigate on the inside. And then there's Brittle Hollow. It will, as the name suggests, fall apart bit by bit because the planet's core is actually a massive black hole that swallows everything in its orbit. Including you. Unless you use the black hole's gravity to rotate around the core and use your jetpack to execute a slingshot maneuver. Oh god, that is coming way too fast! Okay, to be completely honest, I have a gripe with the controls. Flying through space is fun and all, but um... Don't you ever try to play this game with a keyboard and mouse. I noticed it more times than I would have liked, but jumping and hovering between platforms in space requires you to be extremely precise. And you can't do that when you give full boost every time you press a key on your keyboard. But here's the thing, even with a gamepad you will run into sections that will need surgical precision to get through. Especially the last 22 minutes of the game, which I restarted 10 times until I finally gave in and made my controller as unresponsive as it could be. And I should have done that way sooner and I urge you to do it immediately. But on the other hand, I have to tip my hat to the Outer Worlds team. Getting the physics of space right is not easy. Making them fun and simple to understand is even harder and despite my critique here, the gameplay itself is super fun and stays true to the laws of physics. Naturally, you will spend a lot of time cruising between the stars in your vessel which can boost in 6 different directions. And just like in real space, there is no up and down and also no friction. So nothing stopping you from flying upside down over the atmosphere of a planet. 
Yes, they all hurl through space with a different velocity, and the bigger the body, the greater the gravitational pull will be. So do me a favor, don't fly too close to the sun, or it will just suck you in and that will be the end of it. But don't fret, you have an autopilot in your ship, and it can take over the hard part of aligning you with a planet, but you still have to execute the landing maneuver yourself. And of course, if something can go wrong, it probably will at one point or another. Don't worry about that though. Just get your spacesuit, get out, fix your ship. It's easy, just press one button until the repair is done. Surviving in space is made easy as well. Outer Wilds is first and foremost an exploration game, and as such, forgoes most survival mechanics like hunger. You only have two fuel tanks to work with. One of them is filled with oxygen, the other is jetpack fuel. You can use it to rocket jump around the surface like a madman and alter your trajectory, which is sometimes well appreciated. If you ever run out of fuel, then your system will switch to oxygen and use that to propel you through the stars, but it's highly ineffective since there is no combustion behind it. And here's where video game logic strikes. There are trees on the planets. In space without any kind of atmosphere, but they're able to produce oxygen, so just stay close to them and let your tank get filled. It doesn't make any sense from a real perspective, but from a gameplay point of view, these pockets of air act as some kind of checkpoint, so you can explore the planet some more before running out of oxygen. Fuel, on the other hand, can only be refilled by actual fuel tanks, which you can only find with your colleagues that jump around the planet as well, or you need to go back to your ship and refill there. It was after a few deaths when I noticed just how brilliant the design in this game actually is. I already stated that the game gives you absolute freedom. There are no restrictions and you can visit any place, anytime. But how do you even find the clues to solve the mystery of the eye? I mean, the planets are pretty big and yes, you can fly around them rather quickly, but without quest markers and such, aren't you doomed to just find a needle in a haystack? Actually, no. You just implement some good, not lazy game design for a change. Let me give you an example. The path you are on splits in two different paths. The left one is a dead end, just as the right one, but here you can find an item in the corner and some scribblings on the wall. Question, which one do you investigate? And now let's take a look at our home planet from above. It has the village you're born in, a crater on the North Pole, a forest near the equator and some mountains on the South Pole. And that's it. The rest is just green with nothing worthwhile to find. Every planet is created in a way so it can direct your attention to landmarks you cannot miss. If you're looking at plain stone, then there is nothing here. That way you are still guided to the clues, but it happens in a more natural way. All the game is saying is that there is something here for you, but it doesn't push your nose into it. It gives you a sense of agency by offering you to go there yourself and find the puzzle pieces at your own pace. And just like in a real puzzle, it doesn't matter with which pieces you start. I just described my first time loops to you and my first choice was to investigate the Hourglass Twins. But you don't have to. Maybe your first choice is Brittle Hollow, which features the biggest Nomai settlement in the whole game. You just need to start somewhere. Each puzzle piece you find about the eye will be put into your ship's lock, which kinda works like a journal. But it resembles more a mind map than written text and it connects clues and insights you found to other clues. There's just one point of critique. All of the clues and all of the information you can find is in text form. Voice acting does not exist in the emptiness of space, which makes reading your only choice of information digestion. And to be honest, it was at times quite overwhelming to get confronted with multiple and literal walls of text. I was really thankful for the journal feature, but at times I silently wished for some voices to be heard. The game's not all reading and exploration though, that would be boring. In order to solve the mystery, you have to wrap your head around various physics-based and environmental puzzles. The Hourglass Twins, for example, will always shift sand from one planet to another, and if you're too late to enter a cave, you have to wait for another cycle. If you don't know what to do next or how to solve a problem, you can always count on your other astronaut friends who might be somewhere on the planet you are visiting. Talking to them is a delight, because they don't just act as your guides on a planet, but because they all have distinct personalities too. Some more sympathetic than others, but as long as they share some fuel with me, we're good. And as already stated, each of them carries a musical instrument with them that they usually play non-stop. And maybe you have noticed it, but if you put them all together, you will realize it's actually the main theme of the game.
Speaking of which, the music in this game is fantastic. Usually you will just hear your own breathing sounds when you are running around the surface, but as soon as you fly in space or found a ruin, you will be treated to a soundtrack that might even put you into a meditative state. It is very pleasant to listen to and perfectly suited to make space a little less scary and just a little more calm. With that being said, I think it's time for my final word. Outer Wilds is a video game that pushes the boundaries of what a video game is supposed to be. I would say it is a simulation more than anything else. Of course, a simplified one for the sake of gameplay, but a fun one nonetheless. And while you play, you even gain some rudimentary knowledge about space travel. You know, stuff like gravitational pull, why you need friction to stop propelling uncontrolled into space, and the inevitable heat death of the universe. Also, what I really do love about it is that it doesn't compromise its vision with easy out game design choices so it can appeal to more people. No stupid quest markers, no treating you like a stupid kid. It's you, a constantly changing universe and exactly one thing to figure out. And just like a good parent, the game points you in the right direction and lets you go the way yourself. But this uncompromising nature of the game also means that it will not and cannot appeal to everyone. The puzzles are not straightforward and require you to actually work with the information you gathered and think in an abstract way because physics, which can be absolutely overwhelming for some players but on the other hand, incredibly rewarding for those who figure it out, since the puzzles are, in essence, fair. And just like a real puzzle, all the pieces are here. All you need to do is put them together. Finding the pieces, on the other hand, might take some time, which is absolutely acceptable. The solar system you're in features very charming places, which are spruced up by a lot of material you can and will read upon. It's just sad that this one flew under the radar when it came out. But fortunately, the community around the game is growing as we speak. But nobody who already played the game will tell you anything about it, because some things need to be experienced with a fresh pair of eyes and with a sense of curiosity and wonder. The satisfaction of the game stems from uncovering the mystery of the universe on your own. As always, thank you for watching and see ya.